Amen. Thank you, Miss Erica. Enjoyed that. Um, we're going to be in First Peter today. We're going to actually be finishing up our message. But just before I do that, I've asked Brother Rick if he wouldn't mind to come. He and Danny uh, were uh, out this week. Danny, you're welcome to come up with him if you like. Um, they were out this past week doing some work with uh, Randy Taylor and his ministries. And I decided to give him an opportunity to share a little bit of that. Yeah, um, last week, uh, me and Danny had the opportunity to go down to Iuka, Mississippi, to work on the Mount Gilead Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, the church had uh, been struck by lightning and burned down, so they're in the process of rebuilding it. Um, earlier in the year, they'd uh, been down there, some of uh, the group Randy Taylor's associated with, and framed it all in, and uh, this time was kind of down to some of the finish work put a bunch of doors in, uh, electrical work, uh, put the cabinets in the kitchen, and uh, just generally generally finishing touches. Uh, church will be pretty nearly ready to go. Uh, it's, it's kind of was a real blessing because the, the, the church has been without a, a, really a church building to meet in. They've been meeting in the parsonage. They just took all the furniture out of it and they all sit around inside the living room and kitchen and dining room and have their church service in there. So. It was a, a real blessing, and uh, we're glad to have the opportunity. You want to say anything? Yeah, just a, <clears throat> just a lot of painting. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, there was a lot of painting, for sure. But, uh, <clears throat> but it, it, was, it, it was a good opportunity. And uh, you know, the, same, the, the, the folks that were up here working, helping us with the uh, baptistry project, they were down there, and there was another, another fellow from Michigan who was actually supposed to be here with us. But he, he was sick that week, so uh, we, we had a small crew, but we got a lot done. So, thank you. Hey, man, thank you, guys. Appreciate Danny coming up. He's, it's hard to get him to talk. He just he doesn't shut up. He just keeps going, you know. Uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Um, First Peter chapter 5, verse 4. This is our last message on First Peter. We've been doing this for quite a while now. Uh, we're down to where we're talking about things that Jesus Christ has accomplished. And today we're going to finish up with basically his glorious return. Now i got to tell you, I, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. You know, um, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Um, I, ho I hope this series has been a blessing to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's meant something to you. But today, what I want you to see is this, is we still have something we're looking forward to. And that is the coming of Jesus Christ when he does indeed carry us away. His appearing, our rewards, all the things that he wants for us. Now, Peter has just spoken in this passage of the churches, of the shepherds of the churches, actually, the pastors and their duties. And ultimately, uh, there's going to come this day when Jesus Christ himself will come and will, as the chief shepherd, will come. He'll gather up his flock and gather us away and take us home. Now, I want to remind you that as the chief shepherd, he's coming to basically gather up his sheep, but at the same time, Keep in mind there'll be that day too where he'll return and he'll be king of kings, lord of lords. Um, this having been said, what we want to talk about today is when he comes and just gathers up you and I. When he gathers up his flock, takes us out of this world. Now I want to say a couple of things here because I think it's important that after he takes us out, then you enter into a time, the world enters into a time of what the Bible calls tribulation. It's a time where there's a lot of judgments. It's a seven-year period. But keep in mind that when we're talking about signs, a lot of people say, man, I'm looking for signs of his coming. Then stop looking because there are no signs of his coming. There are no signs of the coming of Jesus Christ. There are signs of the fact that tribulation is coming. There are signs of the fact that uh, Israel is going to be judged. There are signs of the Antichrist coming on the scene. There are signs of a lot of different things, but there is no sign of the coming of Jesus Christ. The signs are for the Jews. They are not for the church. And we need to understand, too, that as a church, what we're simply to do is to be ready and to be looking for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he could come at any moment. At any moment, he could come before this church service is over. He could come 
at any moment. So when we're looking at this, I think it's an important thing because as I preach this, I'll be honest, there are times where you'll get excited. There are times where you'll be glad to hear it. There are times where you'll you know, rejoice. You might even weep. You might even do some of those things. And all of us do. When I sit and ponder the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and take me out of here, I got to tell you, it, it really thrills my heart. And I would imagine it probably does yours as well. But here is the thing that's kind of an amazing thing. Although we understand it, although we know it's coming, we don't always live as though we're ready to meet him. And it's such an important thing for us to realize that, yes, he could come at any moment. My guess is, though we know that he could come at any moment, the problem is, is many of us don't believe he's going to. We probably don't expect him to come at any moment. We expect that he'll come maybe not even in our lifetime. But the fact is, it's at his discretion. He comes when he chooses to come. And he could be here at any moment. Uh, I want to share with you kind of an interesting thing. Um, growing up, we sung as a kid, we used to sing this song, and I would imagine many of you sung it too, and you probably don't realize what you were singing. But you ever sing a song called, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain When She Comes? Yeah. yeah. All of us have probably sung that at some time or another. Well, it's a song about, you know, grandma's coming or somebody's coming, whoever it is coming, you know, that, that they're coming, and we're anticipating their arrival. We're looking forward to them coming, and we also know that when they come, we're going to get some special treatment. They're going to kill the old red rooster, right? And we're going to have chicken and dumplings. I mean, it's a glorious time when whoever it is that's coming, it's going to be an incredible time when they get here. But here's the thing. The original lyrics from this is actually comes from an African spiritual, and it says this. The she that it's talking about is this chariot that's going to arrive, all right? And uh, it's patterned after the chariot that, that gathered up Elijah and took him home. And the aver original verses were actually this. Oh, who will drive the chariot when she comes? Next verse. King Jesus, he'll be driving when she comes. The next verse. She'll be loaded with bright angels when she comes. She'll neither rock nor totter when she comes. She'll run so level and steady when she comes. She'll take us to the portals when she comes. Now, i got to tell you, the theology of that song lacks quite a bit, but the enthusiasm of that day when Jesus Christ returns is obviously present. And we can see the excitement of the fact that, listen, when Jesus comes, he's going to gather us together and he's going to take us all home. We're excited to hear that message. But we need to be just as excited to live as he would have us to live until he comes. So I hope and pray that today as we examine this, that the consequences of this, that we'll get excited about the Lord's coming, that we will want to serve him and look forward to his coming, that we'll want to meet him, that we'll want to greet him. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing, and maybe you all have experienced this, I don't know, but we experience this in our home. But if someone we're anticipating coming to the house, we want to try to fix the house up a little bit, you know. But it always seems that they're coming at a time when we're really in disarray. I mean, it's just a disaster. And so it's like, oh my goodness, we've only got two days to put all this back together. We've only got two days to do this or do that. And we'll be scampering around, hiding stuff in rooms. You know how you do it? Hiding stuff in rooms behind curtains, putting it in the garage, doing whatever we got to do to try to get it out of the way to make it at least look presentable, if nothing else, because it's all over the place. Why? Because we're anticipating their coming and we want everything to be just right. Why is it that we don't anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and make our lives what they ought to be? So that we might anticipate his coming, welcome his coming, and be prepared and be ready when he arrives. So let's take a look at some of this. Let's examine, first of all, just his appearing. 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear. I love that word appear. That means when we see him. When we see him. I like that picture, you know. It's, it's that idea of, of looking for him. Uh, when I know somebody's coming, Debbie, Debbie gets frustrated at me because I get anxious. I'll go out and sit on the front porch and watch, you know. I'll, uh, I'll get me a chair, go sit in the driveway. I'll do something. I, I just, 
looking for them to come down the road, you know, because I know they're coming, and I want to see them when they pull in. I remember as a kid, we would go down to visit my grandmother. She knew we were coming. She had a rough idea about when we would arrive, and it seemed like she had this intuition. Every time we pulled in to her drive, every time we pulled into her drive, she would look and, and be standing on the porch, and she'd, because she knew we were coming. Man, she was anticipating our coming. So much so, when we went in, have you, have you ate yet? Because I got food on the table. She was anticipating our coming. And so what we understand is, listen, we need to look for the coming of our chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. Look for his appearing. I want you to look at the manner of his appearing, first of all. He says this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. He says, with a shout. So what we find is for the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Now, the voice of the archangel, which would be Michael, I would imagine, will shout from heaven the arrival of Jesus Christ. Here he comes! Comes the king! Comes the chief shepherd! Imagine when we hear that shout from heaven that calls us home. What anticipation. You know, since the time that Jesus Christ was crucified, yeah. resurrected, met the apostles uh, several times during about a 40-day span, spoke to the apostle Paul on the Damascus Road, uh, gave miracles and such to the early church so that as they began that people could see and get evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ had sent them and had begun the church and that the church belonged to them. Since those moments, since that time, those early years, you know what? He's been pretty silent with one exception. We have his precious word. He's not been so silent here. We have this precious word, we have this book that we can proclaim, that we can preach, and we can teach, where he speaks to us, where he talks to us. It's for that reason, when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is go find my Bible and read my verses, study a little bit, because I want to know what God has to say the very first thing in the morning. I want to hear from him. But by and large, as far as giving us anything else, he's not giving us any new word. Everything he wants us to have is in this book. All right, We don't add to, we don't take away from. But by and large, he has been pretty silent in that regard. He has spoken through his word, but outside of his word, he's been silent. For about 2,000 years, we've preached of his coming. And even though there are a lot of folks who are scoffers and mock and, and scoff at the fact that we preach and teach that Jesus Christ is returning again, in spite of that, he still hasn't come. He's been silent. You know, we've witnessed a lot of things in our world. We've witnessed those who are grieving as a result of sin. We've witnessed natural disasters. We've witnessed loved ones who have died, uh, those who are diseased, many of which who have been mistreated and killed, martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. We've watched as sin has continued to increase, not just increase, but be accepted at large by people. Not only accepted, but even that sin becomes lawful. And in the hearts and minds of a lot of people, that sin has become good rather than evil in their, their eyes and in what they believe. We've watched as abortion has been on the rise, homosexuality has been on the rise, greed, governmental control, false teachings, pornography, adultery, lying, you name it. And still God has been silent, hasn't yet returned. It's a time spoken of by Peter when we're told that God is long-suffering. You know, I think about that, long-suffering. Some say, well, the word long-suffering and patience are the same. And a lot of Bible translations even try to substitute patience for long-suffering. And they're not the same. When we read long-suffering, it's different than patience. It takes you the next step. Patience is just biding your time and waiting for something to take place and being confident that it will. Be patient. Long-suffering is a little different. Long-suffering is being patient with a lot of pain attached. There's a hurt. There's an anguish. I'm waiting, but there is a lot of suffering that's taking place in this wait. You know, as much as it hurts you and I, when we see what's going on in the world, it, it grieves God as well. 
and we think about how he is long-suffering. He is telling us that, listen, these are not the things I want to see. By my permissive will, I have allowed them to take place, but I love you and care for me. It hurts me to see you hurt. It hurts me to see these things take place. It hurts me for you. I'm long-suffering. And so when we look at this picture, what we find is that he is long-suffering. He will allow us, his children, his bride, his sheep, to suffer until there comes a shout. He'll be silent until there comes a shout and he calls us home. Man, I think about that. and It'll be a time where he'll no longer be silent. It'll be a time where he speaks up. We sit back and we say, God, look at our world. Look at our society. Why do you wait? Have you not promised us that you'll come and take us home? But because God is long-suffering, the Bible says to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Keep this in mind. As difficult as it might be, as long-suffering as he is, it's for a purpose, it's for a cause. For every moment he delays, there's another opportunity for someone to trust him as their Lord and Savior. But God, can't you see that we're hurting? We're having to deal with disease. We're having to deal with, with all the likes of this world that hate you. We're the ones that's having, but the longer I delay, the more opportunity there may be for someone to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm glad he delayed until I trusted Christ. Are you not glad that he delayed until you trusted him? There are those that are out there we need to be telling about Jesus Christ because we may only have moments for them to hear and moments for them to know because I have no idea how long he'll delay. But for every moment he delays, there's an opportunity for someone to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But God, I'm suffering, I'm hurting. This world is difficult. There's a lot of pain in this old body. I know, I know. But for one who it pleased even to bruise his own son, he understands and knows that the longer he delays, the more opportunity for someone to trust him as their Lord and Savior. I love this picture. He says that he'll come with a trump, with the trump of God. Now to most of us, when I think about a trumpet, I think of maybe a big loud blast of a horn Maybe even a little melody, you know. Um, I love doing funerals and such that, that, are, um, that are military funerals because I love when they, they, they play, you know, and I, I love to hear that bugle, and it's just a neat thing. But that trump of God. But here's what I find out about the trump of God. It's kind of interesting because we think about it in terms of a trumpet and in terms of hearing this loud blast, but according to Revelation 4.1, Here's what he tells John in, in regard to this trump. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice, the first voice I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking to me, talking with me. A trumpet which said, Come up hither, and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. This trumpet spoke. This trumpet was a loud blast, but it was a loud blast of words. Come up hither. Now I want you to think about this. This trumpet, this voice of the archangel, all is coming out and it's declaring to each and every one of us, come up hither. Come unto me. Come up hither. So when we look at this trumpet, it is an interesting thing to me that it might not be exactly what I think it's going to be. It may rather be a blast that simply calls me home. It's what John witnessed. You know, as long as we're on the subject, uh, let's take a look at what we might experience upon our arrival in heaven. Now, this is really, a, I'm going to really rattle off a lot of verses for you here because the Bible says things a whole lot better than Barry can say it. Amen. And so what we find here is when we think about what is it that I'm going to experience? You ever thought about that? When God calls you home, what is it you're going to see? What is it you're going to experience? What's the first thing that's going to happen? You know, it's kind of funny because I hear people talk about this kind of thing all the time. I do an awful lot of funerals, and one of the things people will tell me, so, boy, I just can't, I can't wait to get to heaven because, man, as soon as I get there, my grandpa, my grandma, my, my brothers and sisters, they're going to welcome me in. I don't mean to disillusion you, but I don't know that that's going to be the case right off. 
I think there's some other things that's going to take place. I'm not going to tell you they won't welcome you. They may very well. But I'm here to tell you that there are things that we'll see long before that. Look at what he tells us in Revelation, pick it up in 4.2. He says, and immediately I was in the Spirit. He, no delay. Uh, immediately. He called, I was there. Come up hither, I'm there. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Stop. First thing I see is Jesus. First thing I see, Jesus. There's not some delay. There is not this uh, a bunch of people I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to walk through to get to him. There's not this group of angels that's going to greet me. There's not going to be Peter standing at the pearly gates giving me a question and answer quiz. None of that's going to happen. He calls me home, and the first thing I see is Jesus on his throne. That's what he says. So what we find is this. He says, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper, a sardine stone. There was a, a rainbow round the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Wow. First thing I see is my focus is on Jesus. Boy, I see Jesus. And, 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 you know, it's like that little nursery rhyme about the cat that goes to England. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to England to see the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you see there? I saw a mousie under her chair. Here she is, this cat, in the full glory of the queen of England. And she bypasses the throne and sees something as trivial as a mouse under her chair. Folks, we stand before the throne of God. Our focus is going to be on the throne of God. His focus was on who was sitting on the throne. He gives you a description of God sitting on the throne. There is a picture of God. We look to him and understand and know, listen, the very first thing I see is God himself. And then I see, after I see God, then I see around the throne, I see the four and twenty elders clothed in white raiment had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, there's a lot of speculation about those elders, and I'm not getting into that today. The only thing I will tell you this is those elders are not angels. They are, they are people, obviously men, that are there and were born of the seed of Adam, were born in sin. God had cleansed them, placed them there. And what they represent is neither here nor there at this point. All I want you to know is this. Listen, around the throne of God, he has his creation that he made, mankind who was created in his very image, sitting around the throne. I love that picture. It says something about how much he loves me. It says something about how much he loves mankind. Tells you about how much he loved us and that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. He loves us and has us surrounding his throne with him. Right. Revelation 4, 5, And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when, when bad weather comes, I don't know why because it doesn't seem to bother me much, but my wife has panic attacks. She starts, she starts gathering up everything that's important to her, and we're going to make a beeline to the basement or something. And she's gathering up, did you get this? Did you get that? No, honey, I don't got No, I didn't. Focus on the, on the lightning and the thunder and the winds and all those things that are going on. Here we find that when John comes to the throne, he sees, he sees God first. His attention is on him. Then he sees who's around him, and then he sees or hears all the thunderings and lightning. Now imagine how much this must have been, how loud this must have been, yet it wasn't in the first thing that he noticed. It wasn't his first focus, because being in the presence of God, so much greater. Look at what he says in verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, 
and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Let me, let me kind of give you this vision for a second. John comes walking in. First thing he sees is God. Wow, what a magnificent sight. Oh, and look at the four and 20 elders around him. Oh my, and, and look and listen to the thunderings and the lightning. Look at that bow above him. Oh my. Oh, and look here. Look at the sea of glass. Oh my, and look at these, look at these magnificent creatures that are here that have all these various wings and, and the different faces. Look at this. Wow, it's like nothing I could have even imagined. What's it going to be when we're welcomed home? What is that first sight we're going to see to be called into glory? And all of this in just a moment, just in a moment, immediately. He was caught up. When he comes, he says, come up hither. Man, the sights we will see. The glory we will behold. And all of these created beings, all of these people that surround him, these elders, and all of these, these angelic beings that, that surround the throne are praising him. Holy, 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 bowing before him. How glorious it must be. Can you imagine this scene in heaven? Now, take that one more step. How God must welcome us there. Man, imagine seeing all of that. I can almost picture, this is speculation on my part, but I can almost picture him reaching out his hand unto me. Welcome home. Welcome home. And bring me in. What a glorious, glorious sight. And I can come right into the throne, crying, Abba, Father. Close, personal relationship. And I look at all of this picture and I think, wow, how magnificent that must be. The manner in which he'll call us home. Look at the manner in which we'll be taken out, period. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us this, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at how he takes us out. Now, I mean, I, I think it's just one of those things that's going to happen so quickly, so fast. I've said before, man, wouldn't this be a great time to be in the graveyard? I mean, I would love to be in a cemetery during this time. You know, even if it's just for a spirit, just for a moment, to see the dead in Christ rise first and then gather us up together with them. What a neat thing that must be. When we look in Scripture, we see a couple of cases where he gathered some folks up. We see where he translated, the Bible says, Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Walked so closely with God during a time where he didn't have God's Word. He didn't have God's book, you know. He, uh, he didn't have the Holy Spirit of God living within him like you and I do. And yet he walked so closely to God, so loved the Lord, so loved doing what God had called him to do and being what God wanted him to be, that God didn't even let him see death. He just took him home. He raptured him out. Now the Bible doesn't use the word rapture, but we use it a lot because basically what rapture means is just be snatched out. And I like that word because it's the idea of being snatched up in a hurry. Yeah. I can imagine Enoch one day praying, God, thank you for how much you love me. Thank you for how much you... Oh, God, and there he was. Just imagine what that must have been like for Enoch. How about Elijah? Elijah's teaching Elisha how to kind of do the prophet thing. 
and Elisha's trying to learn from Elijah, and he's walking behind him. He's gathering up stuff and learning from him and knowing that he's probably going to be the next guy. And uh, next thing you know, this chariot of fire swoops down out of heaven. Elijah jumps on board and carries him home. How cool is that? When you imagine the way that God would do these things, now it would appear that we'll be snatched up like Enoch. It appears that we'll be snatched up just like that. And those who are already dead in Christ, we'll see them gathered up in the air as well. And though our soul will understand, their soul will understand what it's like to be in the very presence of God. They'll be reunited with this body and this body will be changed so that it'll be equipped for all eternity. What a picture. But that's the way God's going to do it. Just sweep us away. I want you to look at the manner he says we'll be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You know, when last the apostles saw Jesus before he was laid in the grave, they saw a corruptible body. I want you to picture that for a second. When last they saw Jesus, he was beaten beyond recognition, hanging naked on a cross, having been stabbed, having a crown of thorns, unrecognizable with blood gushing. Someone had stabbed him with a spear and water and blood had gushed out. And I would imagine they saw him slump over dead took him, laid him in the tomb. They saw a corruptible body. They saw a mortal body die and put in that tomb. No wonder they were so defeated. No wonder they were so downhearted about all of that. No wonder they had a difficult time believing uh, the Marys when they came and told them uh, what they had witnessed about the tomb and in the tomb. No wonder. But when they saw the resurrected Jesus, but when they saw the body that had been raised incorruptible, who was not left in hell, the Bible says, who was not left, who was raised incorruptible, immortal, when they met him and when they saw him, their lives changed. Everything about them changed. Their demeanor changed. Their character changed. They were alive. They were suddenly recognized and listen, everything that he said he would do and could do, he did. What an unbelievable thing. Folks, right now we have a promise. And I believe Jesus Christ to be true. I believe that he died, was buried, and resurrected. I believe that he has prepared a home for me in heaven itself. I believe that I can be with him and will be with him for all eternity. I believe that I'll reign with him for a thousand years. I believe that when he creates a new heaven and new earth, I'll live on that new heaven and new earth for eternity. I believe that he is the son of God and the only hope I have of salvation. I believe that so much so that when he tells me that I'll change, I believe it. I believe it. At the last trump signifies the end of an age, signifies the end of the time of the Gentiles. It signifies the end of the time of the church age. It signifies a time when he says, listen, this church age has ended. It's come to an end. It's now time for me to deal with my nation, the Jews. So today I'm going to call you all home. Come up hither. Well, let's take another look. Let's take it just a little farther beyond imagining all of that and beyond looking at all of that and knowing all of that to take place, if we are believers, if we know Him and, tr and, and truly trust Him as our Lord and Savior, He also talks about rewards. He says, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. A crown of glory. Now I want you to understand, in our context, He has just gotten done talking to a group of shepherds, pastors of churches. It just so happens this particular crown is for those faithful shepherds. All right, But when we look at this, he lets us know that, listen, God has rewards for us. Now, I want you to understand something because rewards are an important thing here. Rewards are not to benefit us. Rewards are something that we have that we can lay back at the feet of Jesus because he's worthy, not me. All glory goes to him. There's none of this that's given to me that I can say, look at what I have earned, look at what I deserve. None of it. None of it. 
It's all about Jesus. So our text is dealing specifically with that. But I want you to understand that what he says in 1 Peter 1, 4, he says this, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What a beautiful picture. He says, listen, I have something for you that nobody can take away. Can't be, can't be robbed. It's yours. It's yours. It's an inheritance. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. And it's not going to fade away. It's reserved for you. It's got your name on it. It's yours. Now, the Bible gives us some pictures of what some of those rewards might be. He does mention five crowns. He talks about the one that's in our text here, crown of glory, which is basically for faithful pastors. But he also talks about an incorruptible crown, which is uh, to, to the ones who faithfully stay the course, run the race. I mean, to those that trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and they stay with it. And man, I'm telling you, they're fervent all the way until the time God calls them home. He also talks about a crown of life to those who have endured various trials and temptations. You know, I don't know if you realize it or not, but we think about folks who have died for the cause of Jesus Christ, those who have been martyred. We think back in days of Bible. But we also are living in a day where there is more of that going on today than ever in history. We just don't see it. We don't live there. But there are folks who are willing to stand for the cause of Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, are martyred, are killed, are, 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 are persecuted, are put in jail. Crown of life. There's a crown of rejoicing. Crown of rejoicing. And for those who have introduced Jesus Christ to others, who have witnessed to him about Jesus Christ and who he is, and see many of them come to know him as their Lord and Savior. And then there is a crown of righteousness, which are those who are ready and waiting and looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm looking for your coming. And I'm ready for your coming. We're also told that we'll be made kings and priests. In Revelation 5.10, has made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. There's a day where we do reign on the earth, and we'll reign as kings and priests over nations. There is the purpose of these works, too. You know, the purpose is to please God and to demonstrate our faith. It's not to say, God, look at me. It's to say, God, you are worthy. Big difference. Big difference. It's not to say, boy, look at what I've done. Look at me. I am a wonderful guy. I do great things. I'm a wonderful person. I help little old ladies across the street. I am wonderful. It's not for that reason whatsoever. It is to glorify God. Our motives ought to be, I know this pleases you, God, so I'm going to do it. I know it pleases. It's not to get a thank you. It's not to receive anything else. It's to say, God, you're worthy, and you deserve this honor. I need to glorify you. Everything we do ought not to be so that we can be recognized, so that we can be known, so that you know, so we can post it on, on social media and say, look at what I've done. It's because God is worthy. And it's our way of saying, God, we know you're worthy. And we do it because of who he is. Revelation 4.10 the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, listen to this, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God, I don't deserve this. I, it's not something for me. But God, you and you alone are worthy. The purpose is to show our thanksgiving. Show our praise. It might be a means of saying, God, I want you to know that you are worthy. And I know you're worthy. And I come and I bow before you. You know, all too often, a lot of what we do, we do because there's a reward somewhere. Not in this case. What we do ought to be because it glorifies God. Now, having said all of these things, let me ask you this question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior first? Because if you don't, this will not be a glorious day for you. You'll be left behind. It will not be a glorious day because you'll not be a part of those who stand before him at that moment, who are able to be welcomed into the kingdom. It won't be you. You've got to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that is a matter of just trusting him. There's not some fancy 
words that will fix it for you. There's not a mom and dad that can take care of it for you. The baptism waters won't do it. Joining the Hilltop Baptist Church won't do it. It's a matter of trusting and knowing. Listen, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to die for my sins because I'm a sinner and I can't do it for myself. He died for my sins. And I believe and trust that the only way, the only truth, the only life is in Him. Trust Him. Dear God, forgive me. And thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. It's that belief. It's that understanding. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The mouth confession is made unto salvation. Today, do you know him? If you know him, are you looking for his coming? If you came today, if you came today, are you ready? Are you prepared to meet him? Bow your heads with me if you would. Dear Father, oh, there was so much to say, huh? I couldn't even begin to share, but just, just a fraction of this. But Lord God, I hope and I pray that you'll take whatever I've been able to share and those words that you've spoken to us through your precious book. And Lord, I pray that you'll penetrate hearts and lives today. To those who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, today, Father, I pray that they'll surrender their heart and life to you. Lord God, to those who know you, but Lord, have slipped into a place where they're just unconcerned where we've fallen short Lord God help us to see and to know that we need to draw closer to you and be more of what you want us to be Lord may we be excited about glorifying you and looking for your coming please dear father may we be a church may we be families may we be the believers that you want us to be that we might better serve you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand if you would.